You probably know how childbirth works, but did you know it's different from species to species? And some animals have rather unique methods. These are the 20 craziest ways animals give birth. Number 20. Elephants the way elephants reproduce is really quite interesting, and you might even be able to relate to some of the things they do. When they are ready to mate, a male approaches, and they all stroke each other's trunks a little bit before the deed gets underway. When that deed is successful and the elephant reaches the end of her pregnancy after 22 long months, she'll seek out a close female contact from her family for support and protection. That's not all that different from us, really. Sometimes the entire family unit will surround the female until she gives birth, ensuring she has all the protection she needs from anything that would want to harm her. Most elephants give birth standing up, and it only takes a few minutes once active labor gets underway. Most elephants will give birth to one calf, which is born head and forelegs first. It's extremely rare for twins to be born. Once the calf has arrived, the mother will then eat the afterbirth to stop predators from detecting her. At least they don't like make it into cookies like some people do. The elephant calves are typically born weighing around 264 pounds and standing at about 3 feet tall. They start walking within 1 to 2 hours and will join the rest of the herd within 2 days. Like this video, smash the subscribe button and click the notification bell right now or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Flatworms Flatworms, known as planarians, are absolutely insane animals. Sure, they don't really look all that exciting, and most people would call them gross, but do you know what scientists call them? absolutely fascinating. You see, flatworms don't reproduce the way we do. While some do get down and dirty, most will just rip themselves in half when they want to enjoy another creature like themselves. These slug-like creatures with two eyes and a weird spade-shaped head will stretch themselves out until they rip apart. But instead of dying as most other creatures would do when they're pulled into two pieces, Flatworms will grow tails and heads where they're missing them and carry on with their business. Scientists even cut flatworms into pieces with scalpels to see if they would die or reproduce, and they reproduced. Four small pieces of flatworm just hopped away from each other and set about becoming their own flatworms. Experts think that each part of a flatworm's body can turn into a head, tail, or trunk, and then it might be some kind of survival strategy. It doesn't matter which part of the body is cut, any part of it can flee danger and regenerate. It's absolutely insane. Number 18. Kangaroos Kangaroos are unusual animals, so you pretty much know they're going to have a unique birth process as well. First, we can't talk about kangaroos giving birth without acknowledging that they have three vaginas. Yeah, three. They have two side vaginas, which sperm travels up after male kangaroos access both, and a middle one which the joey travels down. Joeys are also not grown within a placenta. Instead, the baby will spend about 28 days in the kangaroo to develop a type of protective shell, and then it'll eat its yolk and venture down the middle vagina into the pouch. Once in the pouch, Mama Roo will make a saliva trail for her baby to follow to one of her nipples, and the jelly bean-sized joey will latch on for several months, getting its fill of high-protein, watery, immune rich milk. Six to nine months later, the joey will be large enough to leave the mother's pouch, but might then still suckle from its mother for at least two years. Strangely, when the mother roo feels like her baby is developed enough, she feels confident to give birth to another baby and can provide two different types of milk based on what her babies need. Honestly, it's wild out there in the animal kingdom. Number 17. Giraffes. Giraffes are unusual animals. I mean, just look at those necks. So to learn that they have a pretty unique birthing process probably won't have you batting an eye. Female giraffes are ready to have babies once they reach sexual maturity at about four years old. Once pregnant, they grow their baby for an incredible 15 months before delivering it into the world. And what a dramatic delivery! Giraffes rarely sit down, which means they give birth standing up. The babies literally enter the world by dropping two meters, or about six and a half feet, to the ground feet first with their necks and heads stretched over their knees, almost like they're flying in the Superman position. The fall breaks their umbilical cord, so it's kind of like a bungee jump gone wrong if it were to happen to us. 
It might seem horrific, but the baby would likely be crushed if a giraffe were to give birth sitting down. What's more, that fall actually kickstarts their respiratory system, so they might not breathe without the shock entry into the world. When baby giraffes are born, they weigh about 110 to 154 pounds, making them one of the largest babies in the animal kingdom. Unlike us, baby giraffes are pretty independent as soon as they're born. They're up and walking within half an hour and will master the act of running within one day. If they don't get up, walk, and run, they'll probably be eaten by predators. Number 16. Suriname Toads I'm not saying that human births are glamorous, far from it actually, but at least they don't resemble something from a horror film. You can't say the same about Suriname toads. These toads from tropical forests of South America have a birthing cycle far different from most other toads. It all starts with a male attracting a female by using his hyoid bone to make a clicking sound. He'll then mount the female and begin the 12-hour mating process. The pair perform somersaults in the water, with the female releasing a few eggs at a time. The male catches the eggs, fertilizes them, then rolls them into holes in her back. Once her back is filled with fertilized eggs, skin grows over them to protect them, and she'll spend the next four months hiding away to protect them and herself. The babies will let Mama Toad know they're ready to be born by literally punching their way through the holes in her back. About a hundred babies will be born in quick succession, and they'll come out as toadlets. As they skip the tadpole stage, they can immediately head out to fend for themselves. So Suriname toads don't even need to be mothers to their young. They merely have to carry their babies for four months, and then it's sayonara, or Suriname. I don't know, we'll come up with a better joke in post. Number 15. Hyenas Hyenas don't look like they'd have an overly weird birthing process, but they do. Female spotted hyenas have a pseudo-penis, which is actually a 7-inch long clitoris that just looks like a penis. They also have labia that are fused together and look more like a male scrotum than labia. <laughs> Females even have more testosterone than males, which makes their pseudo-penis grow much larger and also ensures they are the dominant sex of the two. Strangely, even when scientists tinkered with their testosterone levels, they still grew pseudo-penises regardless. And that makes sense since they have multiple uses. Female hyenas use their pseudo-penises for urinating, mating, and giving birth. As you might imagine though, doing the two latter things is quite challenging for them. Males have to practice to work out how to mate successfully, and when they're successful and the female gets pregnant, Pregnant, the babies must be born out of the pseudo penis. There's very little room in there, and as many as 60% of the cubs suffocate on the way out. Number 14 Harp Seals. Harp seals are adorable, and for some reason that might make you think that they're sweet, loving, good mothers. But they're kinda not. Allow me to explain. After harp seals migrate to the Greenland Sea, Newfoundland, and the White Sea to mate, the males get super vicious to ensure that they can secure their lady love. Picture plenty of teeth, a handful of fights, and a few flipper smacks. After the deed, females will actually delay their implantation by about three months. The embryo doesn't attach to her uterine wall until she times it with the availability of pack ice. This is because harp seals like to give birth in groups, and they have to time it so that they'll be able to do that in about 11 months. When it's time for the harp seals to give birth, they venture to the southern regions to hang out on the pack ice. Thousands of seals will give birth together and can identify their own young by how they smell. Most babies are born weighing about 25 pounds and measuring 3 feet long. For almost two weeks, they nurse from their mothers and gain about 5 pounds each day. When they have a thick layer of protective fat and weigh about 80 pounds, their mothers will set off to mate and leave their young to fend for themselves. Number 13. Kiwis Kiwis are the national bird of New Zealand. They're flightless, about the size of a domestic chicken, can't fly, and have hair-like feathers. They are incredibly strange. But they get even stranger, and their most unique features become most apparent when they're with child. Their eggs are so large that they're about the quarter of the mass of the bird. If we carried babies that big, we'd be giving birth to 30-pound monstrosities. Those kiwis deserve a round of applause. Kiwis get so big in their later stages of egg growing that they'll drag 
drag their bellies on the ground and have no internal space left for food. Up to that point, she's already had to eat three times as many calories as she usually would to ensure the baby develops as it should in the egg. Now, you might think an egg that large would make bird life pretty impossible. How's she supposed to fly when she's 30% egg? Well, kiwis are flightless, remember, so that's not a problem. They also have marrow in their bones, much like mammals, so their frames are strong enough to carry the heft of the egg. When most birds lay eggs, the hatched babies are pretty defenseless and can't do much for themselves. But kiwis are different. They're pretty much independent once they crack their way out of the shell and almost immediately know how to evade predators. Mama Kiwi is pretty confident that her baby will be fine, and she abandons her child pretty soon after. Maybe that's why my mom left. Number 12. Christmas Island Red Crabs Christmas Island red crabs are land crabs endemic to Christmas Island and Cocos Islands in the Indian Ocean. Tens of millions of these crabs live on these islands, and they are well known for their migration event, which sees them descending upon the sea once a year, holding up traffic and creating chaos. These unique 4.6-inch crabs live in the forests and spend most of their time in burrows. At the start of the wet season, they abandon their homes and travel to the coast for mating and spawning. They'll need about a week up their sleeves for this event, and the males typically venture down to the coast before the females to get things ready. And by ready, I mean they excavate burrows for their lady loves. Once the females arrive, the males and females will pair up, head to their burrows, and do their thing. Once that's over, the males return to the forest, and the females stay in the burrows for about two weeks. In this window of time, they'll lay eggs, incubate them in their abdominal brood pouches, and then release the eggs into the ocean. The females then return home and leave their crab children larvae to hang out in the sea for up to a month. At this point, they'll venture onto the land as juvenile crabs. Number 11. Sugar Gliders Oddly enough, the mating and birthing process of sugar gliders is very similar to that of kangaroos. Sugar gliders become sexually mature at around one year old, and from the time they are mature, they breed year-round and mate frequently. Once the female is in heat, the male will mount her, groom her neck, and hold onto her back with his front feet to stop her from moving around. When the deed is done, female sugar gliders wait a mere 16 days for their babies to be born. Strangely, many male sugar gliders show interest in this process and might even help with it. Joey's about the size of a grain of rice emerge, crawl into the sugar glider's pouch, attach to one of their mother's nipples, and stay there for up to 75 days. Often, they venture out of the pouch after about six weeks. It's pretty standard for sugar gliders to have two babies, but some can birth up to four at a time. It's vital for them to be locked onto their mother's nipples for up to nine weeks, and if they accidentally unlock before that time, they'll likely die. Their jaws simply aren't developed enough to latch back onto the nipples themselves. It's a pretty slow process for sugar gliders to become independent. Once they're out of the pouch, they'll rely on their mother for up to 10 weeks. Number 10. Snails did you know that most snail types are hermaphrodites? Buckle up, because you're about to learn some very weird things. Yeah, snails are hermaphrodites, and this means they have the reproductive organs of both males and females. This means that they can create eggs and sperm simultaneously and can be the male in one mating session and the female in another. And guess what? Snails can both be fertilized and fertilized simultaneously, so everyone wins in a snail mating session. Snail mating begins with each snail spending a lot of time tasting and smelling. They might even shoot each other with love darts, although this doesn't always go to plan, and even though these love darts are a natural part of their mating process, they can accidentally kill each other with them. The love darts are made from calcium and are about 0.27 inches long. To put that into average person terms, it would be like being shot with a 15-inch long arrow. The arrows are positioned inside snails' internal sacs and are fired before copulation. They contain hormones that stop the snails' bodies from killing sperm. Mating can then begin pretty similarly to most other humans and animals, so we really don't need to get into specifics. It takes just a few minutes, and some snails can also fertilize themselves and don't need to go through this whole mating palaver. Number 9. CC Flies 
CC flies have a lot to answer for. They are only found in Africa and feed on the blood of animals and humans. When feeding, they can transmit parasites that cause sleeping sickness in humans and a version of the illness in animals called Nagana. They are the sole reason that cattle can't be raised that easily in the middle of Africa. The region is about the size of the United States, and these stupid little flies are a massive obstacle to the area's economic development. Anyway, back to mating. Unlike pretty much most other insects, CC flies will feed their babies milk while they are developing before pushing out yellow larvae almost as large as themselves. Researchers at the University of California who were studying the flies to see if they could combat the disease they spread said it reminded them of a clown car. It just seemed impossible for larvae so large to come out of a fly so tiny. They think that their unique reproductive strategy relates to parasitic threats millions of years ago. Experts say that the larvae or adults might have been under immense parasitoid pressure and evolved to keep their larvae inside much longer to reduce the risks of the offspring being parasitized. Number 8. Seahorses we all know where this is going. If you don't know by now, then you probably should. Male seahorses carry the babies, not the females. They carry them in a pouch. When the females in most other animal species perform this task, it's very unusual to see it reversed. Although there's a reason why it happens this way in seahorses. They carry the babies because it allows them to produce them faster and deliver them into the sea quicker. Once the female passes her unfertilized eggs to the male, he'll fertilize them and look after the eggs until they're ready to hatch. In the meantime, the female can do whatever she wants, and whatever she wants typically means she's off in search of another man to pass eggs to. As you might have guessed, seahorses don't mate for life. This way of doing things is probably quite helpful for seahorse populations. At least 37 million of them are caught as bycatch, and the seahorse trade has seen population declines of at least 50% worldwide. There have been drops of more than 90% of some seahorse species populations in recent decades as well. Number 7. Jawfish. Imagine getting pregnant and having to carry your baby in your mouth until it develops. As weird and impossible as it sounds, jawfish species do just that. They are known as mouth brooders, and after mating, the males incubate the eggs in their mouths. It becomes his job to protect the eggs at all costs until they hatch, which can take up to 10 days. The mating process is pretty unusual as well. Males will perform a unique mating display, which involves darting into the water column, hanging motionless, and keeping their fins erect for a few seconds. Seconds. They then zip back into their burrows and come back out and repeat the display a few times. They'll do this for hours if they have to, all the while waiting for an interested female to leave her own burrow and follow the male back to his. Sometimes they'll choose a separate breeding burrow together and she'll lay her eggs within it. Because the males have larger mouths than the females, they'll fertilize the eggs and scoop them up into their mouths. All these eggs are held together with mucus threads. When he needs to eat, he'll spit out the eggs, place them carefully in a burrow away from predators and then scoop them back up again once he's done. Once the eggs hatch and the fry are released, he'll go back to putting on a show for the ladies and repeating the process. Number 6. Velvet Spiders Mothers make huge sacrifices throughout all stages of their children's lives. They'll carry them in their own bodies for nine months, go through excruciating pain to deliver, and then put up with sleepless nights. And even after all that, they still say they would die for their kids. It kind of seems like velvet spiders are no different. Okay, so they're, they're a little bit different because they don't just say they'd die for their children, they actually do die. Velvet spiders from southern Europe and North Africa start preparing to be eaten by their young as soon as they start carrying them. Their abdominal tissue begins deteriorating, making them more palatable to their young. Once spiderlings hatch, their mother's tissues are already partially liquefied. As she feeds her young, the degradation steps up a notch, and her body tissues become a crucial food source for her babies. The degradation process is still pretty slow, and the ovaries are typically the last part of her intact. It's believed that this is so that she can produce another clutch of eggs in case something happens with these babies. After two weeks of nurturing, the spiderlings pierce the mother's stomach and eat her insides, which by this point are pretty much all liquid. The maternal care she provides is described in studies as extreme and irreversible. There's no coming back from having all your insides liquefied and eaten, so she subsequently dies. Number 5. Eels 
Scientists have a fair idea of how most animals reproduce, but there's one they just can't wrap their heads around, and that's eels. Who knew a creature as commonplace as the eel would have such secretive mating rituals? It's almost like they don't like having an audience. What we think happens, at least with European and American eels, is that they travel thousands of miles across the ocean to spawn in the Sargasso Sea. Why? Well, because it has nice, warm, salty water. They then return home along with their newly spawned elvers. And for a long time, we were really just guessing that this happened. We hadn't seen any adult eels in the Sargasso Sea, and we had never seen them on route to this migratory area. But small eel larvae had been found there, so experts put two and two together. So they've now painted a picture of what probably happens. Eels head to the Sargasso Sea, randomly mate with other eels, and then return to river estuaries to live out the rest of their days. Now, of course, other eel species in other parts of the world probably do things a little bit differently, but we haven't really got much information on how they mate either. Number 4. Octopus Octopuses are marvelous animals. They live in many different parts of the world and often reach up to three feet long, including their arms. As unique and interesting as they are to look at, their reproduction process is just as intriguing. When it's time to mate, males will usually approach females, who more often than not fend off the males time and time again. Usually, it's the females that are ready to lay eggs that'll fend off the males. Eventually, the females accept the males and they will sit beside the females or mount them. Copulation takes several hours. The same pair will repeatedly mate over a period of about a week, but during this time, they will both mate with other octopuses. Once that process is over and done with, females will look for somewhere to lay and brood their eggs without being disturbed. They are usually laid in shallow water and attached to a substrate. If they lay their eggs on rocky shores, they'll find a sheltered place and protect their new home with shells or anything humans have discarded, like tins, bottles, cans, and boots. Most females will lay up to half a million eggs and will rarely leave them while they develop. They don't even eat for the entire spawning and breeding period, which can be up to five months. Because they lose about a third of their weight, most females die after hatching the last of their embryos. Number 3. Porcupines I know what you're thinking. All those spines? Porcupine mating must be a nightmare. How do porcupines mate? Very carefully, it would seem. Before mating begins, the female raises her tail and quills, presenting her backside to the male. He'll lift his front paws and walk on his hind legs up to her to get the deed done. Because the female has raised her tail, the male will be unlikely to get hurt on her quills. He doesn't even need to get close to her anyway, because porcupines are actually not lacking in that department, if you know what I mean. The females will then give birth to live young, and there's usually only one baby. They're called porcupets and weigh around one pound when they're born. They're also born with quills and will stay with their mothers for up to six weeks. By the time fall arrives, she kicks them out of home, leaving them to fend for themselves. Number 2. Tasmanian Devils Tasmanian devils are nocturnal hunters and scavengers about the size of small dogs from Australia. They live in coastal scrub and forest areas and sleep in caves, burrows, and even hollow logs. They're not very friendly and don't even hang out with their own kind. The only time they come together is to mate, and even this process is pretty unfriendly. From March to May each year, females will mate with the dominant males that fight to get their attention. About three weeks after conception, they'll give birth to up to 50 babies, which are incredibly tiny tiny joeys. Like kangaroos and sugar gliders, these babies will attach to the four teats in the mother's pouch, but they have to fight each other to get a teat, and those that don't come out victorious simply don't survive. The ones that do survive will remain on their mother's nipples for about three months until they're fully developed. After leaving the pouch, they'll hang out in dens for about three months and then leave the den for good. Most Tasmanian devils live for about five years. Number 1. Platypuses Platypuses are monotremes, meaning they lay eggs even though they're mammals. That's just the beginning of their weird production process. Platypuses are polygamous, solitary animals that mate with more than one platypus during the breeding season, from August to October. Males will put themselves in the running to attract mates by using their ankle spurs to dominate and scare off other males. Hey, wait a minute, they stole my strategy. These contain venom and can inflict some pretty gnarly injuries. Females don't tend to be all that picky with their mates and will enter into a courtship ritual that can last several weeks before mating even takes place. After she has eventually accepted him, she'll let him bite her tail and she'll bite his in return. They then swim in a circle near each other for a few days before he does his business with her. It can take up to 10 minutes for fertilization to take place. After mating, the female will ignore all male attempts to mate during the rest of the breeding season, so the male might head off to find another platypus to mate with. 
There's no denying that what humans do when giving birth is amazing, but I think some animals are on a whole different level. Imagine giving birth like a flatworm. We'd have bits of humans scattered everywhere. If you could give birth like any of these animals, which method would you choose and why? Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.